most people are settled, so I'm going to get started. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Caitlin Dorward. I'll do a little bit more of an introduction in a moment. Um, I work at the City of Vancouver as a social planner, and I'm really uh, honored to be here to be talking about the review of urban farm policy that is underway at the city. And I have a dual um, click system here, so if I forget to advance up here, if someone could give me a little friendly wave, that would be really helpful. Um, So I just thought I'd start um, just helpful for, I think everyone to know, get a little bit of a sense of who's in the room. Um, so I'm curious, could you put up your hand if you are a farmer? Okay. Uh, could you put up your hand if you see yourself as say, like a, maybe a policymaker working uh, in government or another um, couple of folks there? Okay. Uh, put your, raise your hand if you consider yourself more in the advocate or interested realm? Okay. Any category I may have missed? Business owner? Business owner? <laughs> Lots of multiple identities raising your hand. Uh, okay. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm a social planner at the City of Vancouver, uh, where I uh, work in the areas of food policy and child care planning. Um, and food, is, food policy and food systems have been a passion of mine for a long time. Um, and um, so I'm a graduate from UBC's London Food Systems. I worked in uh, food and agriculture research for uh, many years at Kwantlen University and worked at the Agricultural Land Commission before um, starting at the city in 2018. I'm a former member of the Vancouver Food Policy Council and was in that group when the urban farming regulations were first adopted in 2016. So it's been a real journey of uh, seeing those policies from the side of an advocate and um, advisor to the city to now being on the staff side. Um, I am not a farmer myself. I did attend the Richmond Farm School uh, in 2011, and um, I'm a hobby, you know, urban agriculturalist. So I hope that I can bring that um, view to the work that I'm doing, though I'm definitely leaning on the expertise of all the farmers um, to advise us on what needs to change. <laughs> can everyone hear me if I keep going? <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, it's not distracting me at all. <laughs> um, okay, so just to let you know what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to start with providing some Vancouver context. I know that a lot of you know all this, but I just want to make sure we're starting from the same page of what's kind of the context of our municipal food policy history in Vancouver. Um, how did the urban farming policy that we have today emerge and develop? And then um, a, a brief overview of what does that, what do our guidelines currently look like? And then I'm going to dive into the update on our urban farming policy review. What is the objective? What are the objectives of that? Uh, what process are we using? Um, I'm going to get into the feedback that we've heard from heard to date, which is about the barriers um, to farming that are um, within that policy, and some suggestions for changes. And then talk about the next steps and opportunities to provide input and hopefully some time for discussion and questions at the end. So yeah, our Vancouver context. Um, so pre, it's about 2004, um, there had been, of course, decades of community food system organizing, uh, programming, and activism that really informed and pushed um, the city as the, the political or the, um, the municipal entity to really um, put some food policy down on paper. Um, in 2004, the Vancouver Food Policy Council was created, and this is a civic advisory committee made up of citizens that advise city staff and council on issues um, affecting our food system. In 2007, the city adopted the Vancouver Food Charter, which commits the city to uh, the, the development of a just and sustainable food system. And until about 2010, there was a, the development of several kind of one-off policies uh, related to food systems in the areas of urban agriculture, organic waste, and um, other topics. Uh, nothing comprehensive still until about 2010 when uh, the Greenwich City Action Plan was adopted. And this plan uh, established the goal to become, for Vancouver to become a global leader in urban food systems. And relevant to this conversation today, it included some key actions about urban farming. Uh, one was to increase the number of urban farms in the city, and the second was to develop a comprehensive food strategy 
that considers regulatory supports for urban farming. Um, it was pointed out to me earlier that my slide heading says emergency of urban farm policy, which is meant to say emergence, but it might be a bit of a Freudian slip that <laughs> that was what I ended up putting there by accident. So really, um, before this point, uh, what we saw was in the urban farming sector, as you're familiar with, there were about 18 urban farms at the time using various models, um, both business, different business models or nonprofits, and uh, different types of farming going on. Uh, the Urban Farming Society had formed and was really catalyzing a voice of activism to the city to develop some policy around urban farming. Uh, the city was recognizing significant outcomes of urban farming in areas around social justice, food literacy, uh, economic contribution, and environmental sustainability. And farmers, we were hearing, had concern about operating in this kind of legal gray area where there was no, um, um, as I'm going to say now, there was no um, a business license category and no zoning bylaw allowances for urban farming, despite alignment with council priorities, increasing interest, um, there was no guidelines. And so this gave farms kind of this lack of security that they needed to invest in their operations. On the city side, some other points um, that came up were concern regarding property tax implications of urban farming. I'll get into that a little bit deeper in the presentation. Um, and, uh, but, but really overarching this uh, alignment with council priorities. I should say that in this talk, um, when I'm talking about urban farming, my context is all of Vancouver except for Southland. So in the Southlands area of Vancouver, that land is in the AOR, and there's a different set of regulations that apply to the land there. So all of this talk is about the non-Southland uh, portion of Vancouver. So really, like I'm showing, there is a disconnect between what was happening in the sector, uh, what the council priorities were, and then what was actually written down in law. That was my uh, forgetting to advance the other slide, sorry. So in 2013, following up on that commitment in the Greenest City Action Plan, um, there was uh, the, the Vancouver Food Strategy was adopted. And it touches on uh, really comprehensively many different aspects of the food system, but importantly, it celebrates the positive impacts of urban farms and included three actions specifically around urban farming policy development. So it um, directed that or identified the actions to create policy to enable commercial food production as a defined use on zoned lands, to explore possibilities to sell produce directly from an urban farm, and to create a business license for urban farming. So these are all elements that didn't yet exist. So staff had a challenge before them um, in considering how to develop urban farming guidelines that would achieve some of these objectives. How to create an enabling environment for urban farming while minimizing tax impacts to the city and non-farm landowners and legitimizing that land use. How do we strike a balance between uh, enabling normal farm practices but ensuring compatibility with the urban environment and other urban uses taking place <laughs> and how to provide flexibility for the diversity of farming practices that were already taking place and that might emerge in the future. So in 2016, after um, engagement with the urban farming community and lots of work internally between different departments of the city, the urban farming guidelines uh, were adopted by council. And so these introduced uh, changes to our zoning bylaw and our license bylaw and defined two different distinct types of urban farms. So the first is urban farm class A, and so this is defined as the use of land with or without a principal building for the cultivation of fruits and vegetables for sale. And then urban farm class B is the use of land or premises for the cult cultivation of fruits and vegetables for sale, and of which all or part of the use may take place in a greenhouse or other structure and may include on-site sales. So I'll go through just at a high level, what is the difference between a class A and a class B farm and what, what are the um, permiss permissions and restrictions that apply to each under our current urban farming guidelines. So the first one is around zoning. So urban farm class A's are permitted in our residential zones, including uh, institutional properties such as schools, hospital sites, et cetera. Our urban farm class B's are permitted in industrial, commercial, and historic area zones. The size, there are some size limitations on uh, urban farms. For class A farms, there's a limitation of 325 meters squared per farmed parcel, and then a 7,000 meters squared limitation for
for the farm as a whole across all parcels that it may be operating on. And for the farm class B, there's a 7,000 meter square limitation. Farm sales, um, there's a limitation on if you're owning your farmland, uh, that you're farming as a class A farm, and it's non-institutional land, the maximum revenue that you can generate on that farm is $9,999. If you're leasing land, there is no limitation on the uh, revenue that you can generate. On the urban farm class B, there are no uh, limitations to revenue. So these size and um, farm sales limits are related to uh, the farm taxation. So they're set up uh, specifically to preclude properties that are farmed from being able to achieve farm status under BC Assessment, uh, the Assessment Act. And I'll, I'll get back into that when I talk about some of the feedback that we've received. For licensing, the, the changes to our license bylaw created a new business class. Um, so for urban farm class A's, there's a, an annual $10 uh, business license available. Um, and you need a, a business license for each site that you're farming. For farm class B, same thing, you need a, a, a license for each site. And the fee is $151 per year. These are uh, the 2019 fee schedule. Uh, if, you're, if you're an urban farm class A, a development permit, which is a permit that authorizes the change of use for a, a, a piece of land, um, it's only required if you're farming an area over 325 meters squared. And a building permit is only required if you have a building that's over 10 meters squared. For urban farm class B, a development permit is always required. And again, the building permit is required over 10 meters squared. That's a, that's a consistent um, requirement no matter what type of building um, you're using, regardless of if it's a farm building or not. And then sales. Uh, on class A farms, you can sell at the farm gate if you're farming on institutional property, but not from residential yards. And farm class B's farm gate sales are allowed regardless of the zoning. So when this was adopted in 2016, um, some of the feedback even that we were receiving uh, right up to when the council date happened was some concern about some of the limitations of those guidelines that I've just explained. And in that context, and since it was a fairly new uh, area for the city to be working in, council directed staff in 2016 when they adopted these guidelines to collaborate with stakeholders on monitoring the policy over a pilot period and report back. Which brings me to the next section, which is to talk about that review that's um, been underway and is kind of picking up steam now, working towards the council report date at the end of May of this year. So the objectives of this review have been to evaluate the impact of the urban farm guidelines and related policies, bylaws, processes, and communication material. And secondly, to identify opportunities for amendments, communication strategies, and programming that can better support farming. Some components of this that are kind of key to know we're going on, the first would be learning. Um, uh, this is a surprisingly complicated um, policy where there are many, many actually intersecting policies that the city has and also at the provincial level that impact urban farming in the municipality. Um, so a sort of a phase of learning how those all layer together and looking at examples from elsewhere. Uh, listening to stakeholders is a really large component of, of this work, and I'll get into that in a bit more detail in the next slide. And then connecting with staff across other departments to reflect feedback from urban farmers and other stakeholders and consider solutions. So that's a, an important one to note is that um, although uh, the food policy file is led by social policy at Vancouver, that's my department, there are many departments that also um, get involved with this type of policy change. So I'm working with staff in our licensing department, planning, um, the business, or the um, Vancouver building bylaw specialist, uh, finance, et cetera, to uh, reflect back to them what the feedback is from urban farmers and um, work with them on ideas that are feasible to change. So in terms of listening to stakeholders, some um, key, I guess, pieces to highlight there is um, the engagement that was done with farmers, uh, both the Vancouver Food Policy Council and others leading up to that 2016 adoption of the bylaw. From 2017 to 18, 2017 to 18 uh, both um, prepared a, a Class B impacts and recommendations report that's been really informative about some of the challenges experienced by Class B farms under the urban farm guidelines. The urban farming census um, from that time has also been really informative. 
And the other piece there is just kind of the ongoing um, contact that we as uh, city staff have with farmers, um, whether that's in, in our policy portfolio, uh, whether that's through uh, working with them on providing grants, um, working towards um, helping some farmers access land, uh, supporting business license applications and responding to inquiries. So those are all these, um, uh, not necessarily formalized, but they're touch points that are really informative um, for city staff to know along the way what's cropping up um, for farmers as they're working through this policy. And then bringing that towards uh, cur more current, 2019 to 20, and a current round of consultation and engagement that I'm leading with farmers and beekeepers, with VUFs, with the Food Policy Council, um, and then also some of our regional stakeholders, the Ministry of Agriculture and Vancouver Coastal Health. So in my current round of, um, actually, sorry, I shouldn't say current, build, um, gathering all the feedback that we've heard um, through all of those listening opportunities and the um, interviews that I've been doing this year, um, I want to share with you the feedback that we've heard so far uh, on how these guidelines impact urban farms and some ideas that farmers have about uh, changes that, that would help them. Um, the feedback's really falling in, um, I'm sort of seeing these three categories of how do we regulate, so that's kind of what, like, literally what does the law say, um, how do we communicate, so what are the resources that we have to help farmers understand um, what the rules are, what's the face-to-face the -face with staff when they come to the, in, the front desk and, and ask to get a business license, um, and then a third category of how we support, so this would be um, programming or funding or other um, non-policy related avenues to support the sector. So starting first with these um, around how we communicate and how we regulate. Um, a category, uh, the first, a first piece, so our, uh, what I'll take you through here is what is the, the current status of the regulation and then what's the feedback that we're hearing on that, that's kind of the format for this section. So our bylaws, as I mentioned earlier, they define urban farms as um, growing of fruits and vegetables for sale. And so technically products that are not fruits and are not vegetables are not permitted under our current regulation. So we're hearing that this precludes other important farm products that are being grown for sale here currently and that are allowed in other cities. So there's a suggestion to incorporate some of these products. Um, I've separated them out into two categories here, the first being flowers, nuts and seeds, seedlings and starts, uh, high products. Those are products that are, they, the producing those looks and sounds and smells really similar to um, what's permitted under our guidelines right now, the fruits and vegetables, and then for the high products, we have uh, honey beekeeping guidelines that already allow the um, keeping of bees for hobby purposes. And then there's a second category of products, um, small scale mushrooms, eggs, um, fish, and an aquaponics type system that are um, probably significantly different than producing fruits and vegetables and might have other nuisance impacts that would need to be considered uh, within an urban context. Another aspect of our um, bylaws is they restrict the hours of farm activity um, to only take place between the hours of 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we're hearing that uh, early morning um, is a really the best time to do a lot of farming activities that are really quiet, um, non-nuisance activities such as weeding or harvesting. Um, another piece here is hearing that farmers um, often have a kind of a good neighbor agreement or their, their lease agreement with their um, landowner that stipulates the hours of operation that that landowner is comfortable with. Um, so there's already sort of some, uh, yeah, like a good neighbor agreement in place here. Um, and so uh, again, a suggestion to allow for non-nuisance activities outside of the hours, sorry, that should say um, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. The next one is around on-site sales. So as I mentioned, on-site sales are not permitted from uh, Class A farms that are on residential property. And we've heard from some farmers that there's a missed opportunity there for an efficient place um, to sell uh, directly from their farm. And um, besides just from that efficiency, there's a, um, you know, a missed opportunity for engaging with the community and really um, achieving some of those um, objectives that were touched on a lot in Evan's talk around, around food literacy and um, people getting to know where their food comes from and what food production really looks like. Um, and so this is coming along with a suggestion to uh, allow sales from a small farm stand in residential areas. 
Our uh, production practices and the, the guidelines specify that the use of pesticides is prohibited on urban farms. And uh, we're hearing that although a lot of farmers don't necessarily use pesticides, they may use manual control methods and um, be farming in, um, trying to farm in ecologically sound ways. Um, this is sort of seen as a double standard because our health bylaw um, allows limited pesticide use of certain prescribed products um, in other areas that are not urban farms, so landscaping applications, for example. So um, there's just a yeah, perception of farms being overregulated compared to other uh, types of activities taking place in our community. Um, so a suggestion to bring consistency across those uses and that, that would also provide clarity for farms of what they can and can't do. Indoor and rooftop farming is technically permitted um, as a Class B category. And unfortunately, what we've heard is that um, we have an onerous, expensive um, permitting process. The building code requirements are really hard to meet. The timelines for approval are, are so long that it, um, it puts a real financial hardship on farmers when they have to pay for a, a lease of a space that they're not permitted to, to actually produce out of yet. Um, and that the guidance that they receive from staff is either unclear or um, just not available. Um, and then layered on top of, that is all layered on top of what everyone is familiar with being a really challenging real estate market where um, land is not, or um, buildings are not available um, and or occupancy rates are low and um, the cost is really high. And maybe I'll just mention um, that these um, these, this feedback is really consistent with what the city hears in, from other small business sectors as well. This is not just urban farmers that are experiencing this, it's something that we hear from a lot of other sectors as well, within the food system and beyond. So as I mentioned, farm structures that are over 10 meters squared must meet the requirements of Vancouver's building bylaw, which is like our building code. Um, this is again something that any structure in Vancouver that's over 10 meters has to meet that. That's actually a national building code standard. So this isn't a unique um, piece that's specifically regulating urban farms. Um, but despite that, we've heard that this approach isn't appropriate for non-load bearing structures that don't have human occupancy. Um, the cost to upgrade to meet code isn't feasible for most farms to bear. And so there are suggestions to explore ways that we might ease requirements or provide temporary permits. So, uh, yeah, definitely a challenge um, given that there are uh, human health and safety um, concerns and structures, so this is a big one to explore. The next one is around development permits. So like I said earlier, if you're not familiar with a development permit, it's a, um, a requirement whenever something is permitted in zoning as a conditional use instead of an outright use, then in order to do that use on the property, you need to get a development permit. So that development permit authorizes the change of use um, for that activity to take stations that are in place for that use. So development permit is required for class A farms over 325 meters squared and for all class B farms. Uh, we've heard that the application process for the DP is unclear, it's lengthy, it can be very expensive. That's not something that a lot of farms can sustain. Um, we've heard that the process creates uncertainty for farmers and this, this can put a strain on their relationship with landowners. Um, and compromise their businesses. Um, so suggestions to reduce fees, to offer templates, provide greater clarity and certainty about what the city's expectations are in order to actually be issued that DP. Um, then this is a big one. So as I mentioned earlier, the farm size and revenue threshold uh, prevent urban farms properties from achieving farm status. So a little bit of background there. Um, uh, BC Assessment is the provincial agency that assesses property, um, any property, urban and rural, and assigns a classification to it that has a bearing on what level of property tax um, a municipality can collect from that property. One of those classifications is Class 9, uh, or farm class. And in order to achieve farm classification, properties have to meet certain um, size and income thresholds, income that's generated um, from farming and size that is uh, of the property that's being used as a farm. So when the guidelines, uh, the urban farm guidelines were being developed in Vancouver, um, there was uh, concern about unintended um, implications of property tax. And so the guidelines were 
um, specifically designed to prevent farm properties from being able to achieve farm status. And that was through these limitations that are set on the size of farms and the farm sales that are permitted, the 7,000 meters squared total per farm and the $9,999 uh, revenue needed if you own and are farming non-institutional land. As you can probably guess, the threshold to achieve farm status is $10,000. <coughs> so we're hearing from farmers that these limitations prevent them from scaling up. They reduce opportunities to access land and um, hearing really loudly that this, there's a, a perception, um, this, this creates a perception that signals an overarching lack of city support for this sector. Sorry, I should say there is a perception that this signals an overarching lack of support for this sector. Um, it's a complicated one though, because from the general public, uh, the city also hears a, a lot of aversion, of course, to property tax increases. Um, I'm sure most people have heard in the news about um, how much of an issue it was when there is the proposed 8% increase to property taxes last fall. Um, in addition, there's a, a kind of related but not related um, piece, which is that community garden properties are eligible for uh, a different um, type of tax uh, classification, but it does offer community garden properties a tax um, break. And we hear really mixed response from the general public about that, where some people feel that's appropriate given the the positive impact of community gardening, whereas others feel that this is a kind of a quote unquote loophole that um, property owners are using to evade taxes. Another issue is the separate business license, as I mentioned, is required. Uh, sure. We, maybe we can hold it till the end. Is that okay? Keep all the questions till the end. We can definitely come back to that one. Um, a separate business license is required for each farm site. This map just shows some of the distribution of farm um, sites. This was pre-adoption uh, of the 2016 guidelines. So what we're hearing there is, um, especially for Class A farms, which may operate with many sites across the city, the application process is onerous and time-consuming. Um, and there have been suggestions to reduce submission requirements, um, better support this as, an, as its annual process, and provide more clarity um, regarding, regarding license type for nonprofits um, and who is eligible to take out a license. And then uh, my last category here is more our, a, a, sort of a summary of feedback that we're hearing about how we communicate. Um, so some overarching feedback that there are inconsistencies between various city um, online and print resources about urban farming the available resources don't adequately explain or kind of chart city process. They may talk about urban farming, but they don't get into the detail of what is a development permit and how does one go about getting one. Um, there's no sort of one-stop shop for guidance and support for this um, small business sector. There's um, so a suggestion to develop, develop a more comprehensive user-friendly guide um, and have knowledgeable staff that um, can support farmers through that process. And then finally, on the more how we support. So I think an underlying theme that I've been hearing is that in order to flourish, urban farmers need more than just a supportive regulatory framework. And so people have been um, suggesting different ideas they have of other ways that the city could support farming other than uh, changes to our regulations. So some examples um, are um, suggestions to provide compost and leaf delivery to farms, to provide access to city-owned greenhouse space where folks can start seeds um, and don't have to work through their own um, permitting of their own um, greenhouse. Um, access to city-owned land for growing, uh, access to a subsidized commercial vehicle permit, which would allow um, parking their farm vehicles in loading zones. Um, there's been a comments around that the city is very supportive of the nonprofit sector, but not so much small businesses. So is there, um, are there some specific supports that may be available to the Farms that are not operating as a non for profit? Um, could farmers have relaxation uh, water restrictions during the drought when the, the city imposes um, different levels of watering restrictions? Could there be lower water fees, the water meter rate, to properties that have urban farms on them? Um, could the city employ farmers as urban growing experts to community and individual gardeners? So these are just some of the, I think, creative ideas that, that um, people are. Uh, raising when I've been speaking with them about different ways that the city could support 
um, farming to young just changing our regulations. So I wanted to get into some next steps. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this um, the review has really uh, really picked up um, uh, last year when I picked up the file um, and began in my learning process of understanding how the, all the different aspects of the policy layer onto one another, what are all the different departments involved, and that um, need to come along on this journey along with social policy. Um, in January and February, I started, uh, sorry, in January, not February yet, um, started reaching out to farmers to um, meet up with them if they're interested and, and do some interviews around their experience with the bylaw and their feedback, um, farmers and beekeepers. And so I'll be continuing those into February and beyond. So if you are a farmer in Vancouver and you haven't heard from me, it's not because I don't want to talk to you. It's just maybe I didn't know that you didn't have your contact info. So um, please reach out. Um, in February, I'll be uh, the Vancouver Food Policy Council as one of our important stakeholders. Um, we're going to have a focus on urban farming policy at their February 6th meeting. So I'll be presenting similar to what this presentation is and then have a discussion with the Food Policy Council um, to kickstart their um, process of providing feedback. I'm also going to hold a meeting at that point um, uh, with beekeepers um, because there's some, sort of some differences that need to be discussed with beekeepers specifically um, as those, um, the, the guidelines don't currently contemplate the sale of high products. In March, I hope to have uh, one or two meetings to bring farmers together again, if they're interested in that, um, uh, in order to review the, the draft options that I'm arriving at in my review. And then April and May, I'll be finalizing my report to council. Um, throughout this whole time, as I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of work uh, meeting with staff in other departments. Uh, my colleague Elena is here today, and another colleague, um, uh, Cornelia, will be joining in the afternoon. Elena is from the planning department and Cornelia is in our licensing department and so they're just two of the staff that I've been working closely with on um, reflecting the feedback and, and discussing if there are solutions that uh, can be supported across different departments. And then in May, uh, my council date to report to council is May 26th. Um, so more to come on that. Maybe I should actually say that a little bit more clearly. So the the report to council will be um, uh, bringing, my, bringing our recommendations to council as to what changes could be made um, uh, to better support farming based on this, all this feedback that's being collected. So I'm going to leave it at that. We have quite a bit of time for questions and discussion, which is what I was hoping for. Um, I do really want to say thank you so much, especially to Karen and the rest of books for inviting me um, to be a part of the forum today. Um, as a planner that relies on engagement opportunities, I feel so lucky that this is happening and provides a chance for some more face-to-face -face with farmers and to share this um, feedback with you all. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm really open to hearing questions, feedback, ideas, and um, know, finding out if there's anything that's been missed. Uh, if there are specific pieces there, so I'll just open it up there. And if you want to contact me directly, my email address is up there, but I'll be here all day as well. Sorry, the question is, do I know how much, what area, area of land is being farmed? Yeah. Outside of Southland? Yeah, outside of Southland. I don't know the percentage, it's but it's... 
Certainly less than 1%, far less than 1%. Yeah. Right. And so it seems to me that the restriction of not allowing whatever a very small percentage of land Sure, so maybe I'll repeat your question back for anybody that didn't hear. Um, is around, I guess, I'll try to summarize here. Um, what, why bother, why restrict the ability to, for a, such a small portion of the land to gain farm status when the impact of that would not be that very great? It would be very small. Very small and, impact. And maybe a, uh, an urban farm tax bracket could be established rather than saying, no, you're not a farm. Yeah, so So I'll, I'll explain uh, another nuance of the farm um, status. So if a property achieves, um, if a property meets the, the, the threshold to attain farm status, their property tax owing um, goes down significantly. The property tax that the city no longer collects from that farm um, still needs to be, that money still needs to be collected by the city because the city has an annual budget that it needs to achieve. And so the property tax that is not collected from that property um, is, is picked up, all the other properties that don't have farm status sort of pick up the tab for that tax going. Um, so that could look a few different ways. If there was, say, a residential property that achieved farm status, that um, actual dollar figure might be not very high. So it would be an individual residential property owner um, um, benefiting from a lower property tax owing and other um, property owners picking that up. On the other extreme, it could be a large, I guess another point to that is the residential tax is not, um, the rate is not as high as the commercial and industrial tax rates. So if it's on, on the other hand, if it's a larger commercially zoned site, that might be held um, by a, a company for development. Um, if that property were to achieve farm classification, the revenue um, savings to them or the tax savings are very significant and the amount deferred to small business owners and property owners is much higher. Um, so there's a perception there that it's unfair for a corporation that may own a large piece of land to be saving money at the kind of expense of um, other land owners in the city. Um, so the, the concern is not so much that the city is making less money because the city will still collect the same amount of money overall, it's that who is paying for that. Um, and to the point around um, why, why, why might make this restriction for such a small area of land, um, the, the thinking is around the um, as we've seen with community gardens, that if the opportunity is there to, to get a lower tax rate, that some people will do whatever they can to get that. Um, so there was concern that there could be a proliferation of properties across the city that would be um, getting farm status, and that that the um, cumulative impact, sorry, cumulatively increasing impact of that. So you're, I've heard that point before. So that's that's definitely feedback that we're hearing. Yeah. Maybe in the tuke and then. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the data points. Our license, business license bylaw, does, our business license application does not. Um, no. Where that would come into effect is if somebody, um, if somebody applied to BC assessment for farm status, um, and it came to light that their revenues were over $9,999, the city would have an opportunity to enforce that that rule was not being followed. But we're not actively collecting that data. Um, I'm just going to go, yeah. I just, I just want to say thank you. I love that urban farmers have been meeting with, and it's really awesome to hear that we have someone on the city side who's so supportive. So thank you for that work. It's 
That's a great question. I'm hoping actually that Anjali will, um, her presentation, the first one after lunch, to give the preliminary results from the census, will really speak to that. Um, maybe I'll just say a bit and, and then I'll ask you if you want to comment on this. Um, the number of farms on my contact list for interviews happens to be 18, um, but I haven't heard back from some of those farms, so I don't know if that's because they're not operating or they're not comfortable or interested in, in speaking with me. Um, so anecdotally, I'm not sure, maybe the number is about the same. Um, there, the, there are some new sectors that have emerged. I don't think in, um, in 2016 there were any flower farmers, as far as I understand, and that's, that's a new area. Um, but maybe Anjali, if you want to... Sure. Um, briefly, I don't want to... Yeah, I'll, the second part of the takeaways from my talk after lunch, um, to talk about the draft results of this which is just focusing within the city. Um, it's gone down. So the number of farms who responded to the census in 2016 was not all farms, but it was 13. Um, and I think we know that, or we think that five of those farms are no longer operating within the city. Um, and at least one of them is still operating, but has moved to a different jurisdiction because of you know, the guidelines and the others, we're not really sure you know, what the reasons are. So uh, to date, we've had 10 farms respond to the census completely or partially, but only eight of them are still active. So definitely, um, number of farms has gone down, number of plots has gone down, square footage has gone down. And so, um, that's, it's still kind of incomplete data right now. So if I haven't talked to you before the census, definitely uh, please participate so we can have a fuller I think that also raises, um, like I mentioned in the piece around um, indoor farms, I mean, that's a, being such a challenging um, real estate market that we have here and, and how cost costly it is to live in Vancouver. You know, that's not just um, a challenge for indoor farms, it's a challenge for outdoor farms as well. And so um, really seeing this set of guidelines that are do pose a lot of limitations on farms layered on top of the cost of living and the cost of land and hard to access land makes it, it does make it quite hard. So yeah. I know I, I know you all know that. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. So I'm wondering about zoning. So as far as I can understand, and I'm just kind of looking around on the website, uh, it's like Gastown, Yale Town, and like around Melton. So is there a way to get a variance for a space that's a block and a half? outside one of those areas. There was an urban farm on Easy Park mm -hmm. downtown, mm -hmm. and I see it's still on your map, mm -hmm. but um, I'm a block away from there, and I'm not sure if they got a variance or mm -hmm. how that works, because I want to do indoor farming. Do you know what the zoning is of your space specifically? downtown district. Oh, okay. So um, supposedly, I can do almost anything, mm -hmm. but when I call the city, they, well, for one, they won't talk to you on the phone. So. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, I don't understand why why one company was allowed to do it, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if it's because they have more resources to just mm -hmm. approach the city, mm -hmm. because I have none, mm -hmm. and um, like, am I barred from doing it? So the question is around zoning, so our Class A farms are permitted in residential zones, Class B farms are permitted in uh, industrial, commercial, and historic area zones. Um, so zones that fall outside of those um, urban farming is not necessarily permitted. There are some CD1 zones where farming is um, included as a conditional use, um, but the question is specifically about the downtown. I'm CD2. You're CD2, okay. So CD, sorry, I thought you said DD2. I, I, I said DD, it's in the downtown district. Okay. It's, it's classic. As a CD zone? CD2. Okay, so I actually, this was on my radar, but I thought it might be a little bit too boring for this presentation, but it's this issue of CD zones. So uh, a CD zone is a, a comprehensive development zone, and they're they're um, created when a, they're often created, and Elena, if I, if you 
help me out here if I get anything wrong. Uh, when a property is rezoned, um, often a, instead of um, assigning that property into one of the specifically crafted to accommodate the uses that the applicant who's asking for the rezoning wants to have take place there. Um, but the city also has an opportunity to add kind of a basket of uses that um, might be appropriate or that are that could be appropriate in that site um, to provide flexibility in the future for different uses that may come up. For example, urban farming. Um, so I have a um, slide that when the um, CD1 zones are created, um, I'm not yet sure, as I haven't had a chance to connect with the um, rezoning department on this, but I, I'm not sure what the process is for them to identify those um, kind of basket of other goods that the applicant might not specifically be asking for. Um, so I want to have that conversation with them to see um, if urban farming is something that could be considered as a uh, use that's added uh, preemptively when the zone is being created. Um, so that's one aspect to, um, that I'm exploring that would address new CD1 zones that are being created in the future. In your case, you're talking about a CD1 that's already been created and, and urban farming isn't in there. So unfortunately, in that situation, to have urban farming added, it would be, it's a type of zoning amendment, a text amendment, and I think the application fee is over $20,000 to apply for that, which is clearly not in reach of urban farmers or many other folks in the city. Um, so it's also on my radar to do some looking into which properties that are CD1 zone may be appropriate for urban farming, and is there any way that we could um, apply or you know add the urban farming into those ourselves as a city? Um, but that's again, I haven't had that conversation with our rezoning department yet, so that's very tentative. But just ideas that, are, that we've been working on. Is that a follow-up or anyone? Maybe I'll just go to the back first. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if That's a great question. If you know or if you are any of those people and you are willing to speak with me, I'd love to talk. I have um, contact information um, through previous discussions with a few of people like that, um, but it's not comprehensive and um, in some cases people are um, feeling pretty burned, to be honest, and which I respect and so um, aren't necessarily willing to come back and explain to me as the city person um, what they have what we put them through um, so if you are willing to do that or interested and um, or have some feedback in that regard i think that's really important um, the other piece I, I should have said this at the start actually is that this review is not linked to bylaw enforcement and um, so we know that a lot of firms are operating outside these guidelines currently um, whether they don't have a business license or they're doing other um, selling products that aren't currently permitted um, so I'm, this is not linked to bylaw enforcement, and it's uh, to the contrary, it's really important that we hear from farmers that are operating in that way, um, because often those those signal what the limits are, limitations are of the policy, and um, can push us to make changes um, if possible or where appropriate um, to um, open up more opportunities for urban farms. Are you referring to the urban ag guidelines for the private realm? Yes, correct. I'm sorry, the question is how much work goes into them? Can well, you I'm clarify? Curious, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of curious internally within the city, like, um, uh, yeah, the other question is how can those, how can those guidelines be um, hmm, That's a tricky one. Uh, uh, those... I'm, not, I'm not asking for ideas. Okay. I'm asking how can I like, give you ideas, or how can, how can ideas be presented that will Oh, okay, great. Um, so those guidelines are not part of, um, or they haven't been part of this review so far. They haven't been part of what I've been looking at. Um, but I'm happy to chat, and if you see a link between those guidelines and the issues on the table as part of this review, I'm all ears. Um, and even if there isn't a link, right, let's chat. Um, there, um, yeah, I, I guess, long story short, that's not on our work plan right now to amend those, but if there are some challenges or issues with them that we're not aware of, we're always open to hearing that. And our food policy at 
don't know, it's not up there. Foodpolicy at Vancouver.ca is um, that email goes straight to my team, um, which is three of us. We all work about half time on food. And so any issues like that, we're always happy to respond to in there. Yeah. Yeah. So my other question is in regards to urban farming, I, I believe that urban farming is considered to be in soil and that if you just do hydroponics, then you're considered to be a manufacturer. And so you're not subject to the same rules. So is there any truth to that? Have, uh, so the question was, the impression is that urban farming is defined as being in soil. And so if you're growing in a soilless medium or growing hydroponically, then you would um, not be subject to the urban farming regulations. You would rather be subject to the food manufacturing regulations. So I hadn't heard that until actually just last week, um, where I heard that um, some in, other, in some other cities, that's the license category that is um, offered to uh, aquaponics folks. Um, so I don't have an answer for you specifically, but I, um, my impression thus far is that we would regulate, we would license that as an urban farm, um, but it's on my radar to look more into it. Yeah. Through this review. Um, I should have an answer before that because I'll have to have a draft that would um, be ready about a month before May 26. So yeah, I'm happy to chat more and follow up. Yeah. Yeah. Does your report on May 26th need to be ratified, or is that, is that the important thing? Uh, by rat the question is, does the May 26th report need to be ratified? Do you mean adopted by council? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I um, anticipate that I'll be reporting um, to share what I've learned and, and recommendations that um, uh, for changes, amendments to the guidelines. Um, any amendments that are being recommended need to be supported by all the different departments in order to get in front of council. Um, so that's what, what I'll be um, getting up there with. Yeah. So those would, yes, they would require a vote um, by city council. Um, if there are changes to the zoning bylaw, which would be entailed in many of those suggestions that were made, um, then that would have to take place at a public hearing. So yeah, it does have to be voted on by council. So the question is around farm gate sales, and um, the guidelines don't permit farm gate sales from Class A farms unless you're on institutional land. And the comment is that there's a real missed opportunity there that that the public wants to buy from the farm gate, and that we're missing an opportunity um, for that engagement and um, a business opportunity for the farm. Is that a good summary? Um, so yeah, that I've been hearing that. I, that's definitely a big um, uh, something I've reflected back to other departments. I know that in some other cities, um, Victoria, for example, they allow farm gate sales and they have provisions for a small farm gate stand. Um, so those are some of the things we're looking at. I think when the guidelines were adopted, um, it was a really new thing in Vancouver um, uh, for staff and council. And um, uh, there was, yeah, wanting to try to sort of take the first step and not go all the way. Um, and so I'm, yeah, Hopefully, with this feedback, um, we can consider if that might be allowable in the future. So, yeah, it's definitely on my radar. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if your work includes establishing some hard targets, like what's really driving the establishment of conservation of the rural function? Like, where's the vision, the city's vision hmm. about where we're trying to get to? Can it be less uh, limiting? So, the question is do we have, um, are there some hard targets that are driving this, um, this review? Um, but do you mean targets in terms of number of farms or impact or? Well, however it's quantified. Okay. We're looking for some kind of quantifiable goal here other than being less uh, restrictive. Sure. So the 
Green and City Action Plan um, set a target to increase food assets by 2020, um, and urban farms were one of the um, food assets that was um, defined as one of those, um, something to count towards achieving that metric. Um, so there is that um, hard deadline of increasing number of urban farms. Um, in hindsight, that um, there's that might not have been the most nuanced approach, just let's increase the numbers um, and not measure impact. Um, so the city itself hasn't been collecting data on impact, so we supported the, the last census that was done and we're really looking forward to the results of the, the current census of urban farming. Um, but I think our, um, other than just kind of, well, the, the motivation to support the sector is because of the alignment with our Green and City Action Plan, with our Healthy City Strategy, with our Food Strategy, with the Park Board Local Food Action Plan, um, with innumerable other policies that the city has that um, speak to the importance of this and the role that urban farming can play in a livable um, city and green city in the world. So it, there's a lot of a lot of high level alignment with um, um, making guidelines that are more supportive. Yeah, Paul. Hi there. Uh, just, just I guess I'm thinking about uh, that. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any sort of moves in the city to implement a an inclusive urban farming uh, allowance for all zones, so that you don't have to do a spot um, you know, tax change or this particular zone or sub zone, but that the city will explicitly, unless otherwise stated, allow for certain kind of activities, whether it's you know, Class A farms or, or whatever else. So, do you mean that the question is, could the city allow? I think it could. could allow farming in all zones rather than that being the blanket approach rather than right. in each zoning schedule say urban farming is allowed or in some of the zoning it's schedules it's yeah um, that's a good question so in some so that would be the, um, the section of the, the bylaw that says the uses that are permitted in all zones yeah. rather than it showing up in the district schedule itself um, that's a great question something I can talk with Alina about in the planning department um, I'm not sure I think that, you, that that approach wasn't taken in 2016 because there um, was concern that urban farming might not be compatible with um, some of the other zones in an urban context. Um, it, that, yeah, that opinion might change now that we see what urban farming looks like and um, see that it actually can take place in lots of different ways. Um, so that, yeah, it's just a good suggestion. Level one, uh, maybe I can <coughs> go to that question and then see if we should wrap up, but yeah. Uh, I guess the comment, I'm looking at this tax structure and the discussion earlier about how the old word is going to allocate taxes to the situation. And I'm wondering if you can bring that to council from around the other way, you might see that the more people achieve this farm standard, the more social pressure there is on those who are not farming in their area to get on the Yeah, the city would look really different. <laughs> I think that the comment was that if maybe a farm status was allowed, then um, you know, is that a good outcome if there's a proliferation of farms across the city? Um, I think, yeah. Maybe I have time for one more. I think we're going to 12, is that right? Yeah? I think I don't understand the link with insurance. Can, um, can you explain? Sure. Uh, property taxes, uh, which was that high oh.
So I think the overarching theme of the comment is around the relationship between the land, the, the landowner and the farmer who's often a tenant. Yes. And that taxes. the taxes and insurance and permits, et cetera, et cetera, put, can put a lot of strain on that relationship. Um, that's a yes. good summary. And so is there a role the city could play in that regard? So I think that fall, falls into this category of kind of how we communicate. And um, I think the resources that we have right now aren't sufficient. They don't explain the ins and outs adequately. Um, there are some places where there are inconsistencies in what we've stated, um, and it's not clear to folks where they can go for support. Um, and then, in addition, sometimes the staff that are contacted may not have knowledge about urban farming and um, don't have an answer or don't have the right answer. Um, so that's, yeah, not, not necessarily policy change, but process change and communication change. And, um, so that that work, um, probably so that that's the kind of thing that probably doesn't need to go to council for approval. You know, if we're going to create a guide and handbook for urban farming, that's not something council necessarily has to approve. So I got to check with. Um, oh, you're towards the farmer. Okay, I guess it's, I mean, it's hard for me to say if I don't know what the other source of information was. Um, and so I think when there's a case by case situation like that, um, again, that's hopefully where staff, like staff in my department, could support um, by being a contact point for urban farmers to reach out and say, hey, this is what my landlord's insurance broker or accountant or whatever told them. Um, is that accurate or not? Um, and for staff to be able to, to respond to that. But it also makes me wonder if um, communication material wise, we should have some material that's for farmers, but also some that's specifically um, that's from the landowner perspective. Like, so your tenant wants to farm <laughs> kind of thing. What does that mean for you as a landowner? So that, I don't know if that would help, but. I think that might be it. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really um, looking forward to continuing to connect. Like I said, if you want to talk more, if you have issues or ideas, um, I'm available at the email address up there or I'm here all day. Um, and the more that we hear from you, the, the more this will be a success. So um, I hope that we can continue to work in partnership. Um, so thanks again. Thank you so much to Caitlin for all of that great information. And also thank you to the city of Vancouver and all the other staff that are here today. Don, right? Just saying thank you again to Caitlin. Thank you to the city of Vancouver. So we are breaking now for lunch. The lunch is going to last until 1.20 p.m. It will be served in here. Um, you're welcome to go off site and come back, of course, but we will have a great lunch being served in here. Uh, reconvene at 1.20, and again, we'll have sessions in this room and sessions upstairs. Please refer to your program for detail on those. And again, as usual, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me, Karen, or Judy. And uh, I will see you all again at one. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, follow us. Yes, so there will be forms to fill out. So I'm not sure what the details of those will be. But again, when you get them and when they're handed out, please leave them on your chair and do take a moment to fill them in as well. Any other? Questions? Okay, great. Well, enjoy lunch, everyone, and we will see you at 1.20.
Thank you. 